So we're into uh, gas power. What's that? Come on now. All right. Are you going to... Now, I wonder what that was. Try this again. So last time we talked about internal combustion engines, auto cycle, diesel cycle, and we introduced the Brayton cycle, which we, as a basic backbone or uh, way of analyzing gas turbines, way of analyzing gas turbines. I think it's easier to start analyzing gas turbines for producing power, just like the vapor power cycle. Later we'll get to other uses of gas turbines um, for thrust and propulsion systems. But now we're going to talk about some enhancements, regeneration, reheat, and intercooling applied to the basic Brayton cycle. Have you seen the term regeneration before? Yeah, we saw regenerative vapor power cycle, didn't we? And so what was the basic idea in the regenerative Rankin cycle or vapor power cycle? Try not to burn expensive fuel to heat up feed water using some hot steam within the cycle itself without using external fuel source so that when it goes into the steam generator or boiler that it's already warmer. Yeah. So the regenerative Brayton cycle. So we'll start in our major components of the Brayton cycle are a compressor and then we'll go to a combustor then we'll go to a turbine and you have another heat exchanger, I'll just call it HX. And we would go into the compressor, state one, out of the compressor, into the combustor, state two, out of the combustor, into the turbine, state three, out of the turbine, into that heat exchanger, state four. But we found that the temperature at four is high. And now you're just going to be dumping it to the atmosphere. Couldn't we somehow preheat the gas is going into the combustor using that high temperature exhaust before we dump the rest of it to the atmosphere? Sure. So what we do is we break that and we take the exhaust out to a heat exchanger and that is a regenerative heat exchanger. And then out of the regenerative heat exchanger you still have warm gases, you still have to dump some to the atmosphere, and a lot of times the book won't route the plumbing, so to speak, all the way down there, but if you wanted to, this is how you would reroute it and get it back to that heat exchanger to dump it to the atmosphere. So what do we have for our major work transfers? We're going to have the work out of the turbine, we're going to have a negative work out of the compressor. What about our major heat transfers? We're going to have a major heat into the combustor and a negative heat. Whoops. Let me draw it this way. A negative heat into the heat exchanger because it's really heat rejection. Um, what about that heat exchanger? called the regenerator it's just within the cycle it's not to the surroundings there's no heat transfer from that regenerative heat exchanger to the surroundings or from the surroundings only from the surroundings in the combustor and only from this or to the surroundings in this other heat exchanger okay so that's the enhancement or the change for the regenerative uh, Brayton cycle. Let's solve a problem. So let me do this. As I read the problem, I'm going to try and recycle this illustration. So I'll just copy it and we'll paste it down here. All right. And as we read the problem, we're probably going to be thinking of populating a table of properties. And we're going to have to have different states for those properties. And so I'm going to introduce uh, states that are consistent with the textbook. So state one is the same state that's the inlet to the compressor. State two, 
Um, let me see about this. Do they have state? Uh, two is the outlet of the compressor, but the inlet to the combustor is not a numbered state, but a lettered state. So they're deviating its state X. I wish they didn't do it. I wish they just renumbered the states, but they didn't. And they left state three as what goes into the turbine. And they left state four as what goes out of the turbine. But then what comes out of that regenerative heat exchanger up here is state Y. And so Y is what goes into, I'm kind of renumbering it there, or re restating it, but why is what goes into that other heat exchanger. So um, they, they usually, you know, it's nice. It says, oh, we're going to have a rule of thumb that we number our states, state one, state two, state three, and then all of a sudden they get to chapter nine. Psh, nope, we have state X and state Y. Just have to deal with it, okay? So let's read the problem. So air enters the compressor. Uh, volumetric flow rate of 75 cubic meters per second at a given pressure and temperature. So this volumetric flow rate we'll later use, but we want to start organizing information, so different states. And the pressure, either we stay in bar or we move to kilopascal, it doesn't matter. And the temperature in Kelvin, so state 1. They give us that it's one bar and 290. The compressor pressure ratio is 18. So right away, it's 18 bar at state 2. The, and they give us the maximum temperature. We'll get to that. The isentropic efficiency of the compressor, so right away, I've got to do that analysis of the compressor. And it's easy for me to do it in two steps. So I'll think of state 2S in state two actual. They both have the same pressure, but they don't have the same temperature. One is isentropic compression, and the other is gonna use that isentropic efficiency of the compressor, which is 88%. Likewise, the turbine has an efficiency of 93%. Uh, And then the generate regenerator effectiveness is given 80%. Well, hmm, maybe we need to think a little bit more about this regenerator. Let's go back to the previous slide. And they give us the efficiency of the regenerator is something. What was it, 80% for this problem as an example? Well, what exactly is it defined as? Well, here's our numbering system. So it comes out at 2. There's state x comes out at 4 in their state y. Okay? So um, you think about what is the maximum amount of heat transfer from the hot fluid to the colder fluid going through that heat exchanger. Well, the maximum would be uh, the change. It's coming in the hottest of the hot is H4. And the coldest of the cold is H2. The mass flow rate is the same. The m dot for the uh, from 2 to x is the same as the mass flow rate from 4 to y, isn't it? That in our analysis, it's an air standard analysis, and we neglect the mass of fuel. It's just the same mass flow rate. And so the Q dot would be M dot times that delta H. And so on a per unit mass basis, that's the maximum heat transfer from the hot fluid to the cold fluid. Well, Q actual is going to be less. Q max. How much less? The regenerator effectiveness. So the regenerator effectiveness is the actual amount of heat transfer divided by the maximum, which is H4 minus H2. How could uh, this actual ACT for actual, that's bad looking ACT, uh, how could we measure that actual? Well, it would be how much was actually gained in the cold fluid. This H of X, the enthalpy at the exit X minus enthalpy at 2. 
So if you are interested in finding h of x, it would be h of 2 plus the regenerator effectiveness times h4 minus h2. Does that make sense? Let's do an additional step, which would be assume constant specific heats. Assume constant specific heats is applicable. Well, couldn't I then re-express the regenerator effectiveness as C sub P times Tx minus T2 divided by C sub P times T4 minus T2? Sure. And then that allows us to calculate the temperature at X, which is the temperature at 2 plus the regenerator effectiveness times T4 minus T2. Play a little quick game here. Uh, what if, you know, what if the regenerator effectiveness is equal to 100%, then what is Tx? You're very good. You're very fast. I like that. It's T4. It's T4. Makes sense? Yeah. Uh, but this is the, the primary definition in the textbook. Accounts for variable specific heats. But we like to use this one with constant specific heats. I think this is easier to understand in terms of temperatures. All right. So what do we do? We have state X and... It's at 18 bar, and it's coming out at a different temperature based on the regenerator effectiveness of 80% for this problem. We always have ideal gas behavior, but here they're saying assume constant specific heats and develop uh, information or solve for the net power developed in megawatts, rate of heat addition in the combustor in megawatts, and the thermal efficiency of the cycle. So let's continue our property table. We'll have state 3, and 3 is at 18, and here is our maximum temperature, 1900 Kelvin. And then you have efficiency of the turbine, so it's 4S and 4 actual. That'll drop back down to the 1 bar, 1 bar. And then it'll drop to Y at 1 bar. And now we have a lot of work to get those temperatures. So how do I get temperature at 2s going through the compressor well we've done a couple problems like that haven't we wouldn't that be in equation form maybe i write it up here t2s is equal to t1 times p2 divided by p1 the pressure ratio raised to the k minus 1 over k how many people recognize that equation excellent do you know you may not have an equation sheet available for the next exam? I don't think it's too much to ask people to know these equations. If you've been solving the problems, doing the homework, there's only three real equations so far, right? And the rest of them are pretty straightforward and simple. Okay? So uh, you, you don't need to memorize, you just become familiar through use by using it yeah so just brute force memorize it then I haven't made up my mind but I'm really leaning toward it okay it's not too much to anticipate the other faculty who uh, taught here last year but he's not teaching here anymore he he really wanted to move away from the equation sheets professor Ali he didn't want them Is it? They're too much of a crutch. It's no good. The students don't learn thermo, thermo like they should learn it. And I had to agree, but oh well. So anyway, so you can crunch through and find the temperature. Um, T2S, which is 562. How about T2 actual? Would it be greater than or less than T2S? Will the next temperature we calculate, it'll be greater. That's right. And so T2 actual is going to be T1 plus 1 over the isentropic efficiency of the compressor times T2 isentropic minus T1. 
And if it's 100%, then you get T2S is equal to T2 actual. Boom. But here, because of the lower isentropic efficiency, the temperature came in at 615.7. This is a point zero there. If you want to keep more digits, you should on all intermediate calculations. And then what did we have for... Uh, I'm looking at a wrong sheet of paper. Um, what did I do? I grabbed the wrong sheet of paper, which is real embarrassing. I have it all memorized, but the numbers. <laughs> I don't have, hold it, is this it? What's our pressure ratio? 18, good. Com efficiency, 88. In the compressor, 93. There, that's good. 80%, that's good. And T1, 290, good. One bar, perfect. Okay. So you run those numbers, 662.3 and 713.1. How many people, did anybody check me on the calculation? It doesn't take much to check, okay? But if those are not right, raise your hand. And I'll get the right sheet in front of me. But I believe those are correct. And now for state X. You can't solve for state X until you go and get T at 4. <laughs> so skip it for a minute. Come back to it. So how about the analysis from T3 which is the temperature at 3 is 1900 out to T4S, that's 832, and then it's 906.7, very similar equations to the compressor to analyze the turbine. Now that we know the temperature at 4 actual, then we can say, well, um, the what is, the, however you want to do it, but the regenerator gives us the uh, Effectiveness gives us um, the Tx minus T2 divided by T4 minus T2. Hence, Tx is equal to T2 plus 1 over the regenerator. No, it's not 1 over. It's just effectiveness times T4 minus T2. And this temperature for X comes in at... 868. So we had sort of free heating of the gas before it got into the combustor going from 713 to 868. That's going to improve performance. If you want, we can calculate Ty. We should do that. And this comes in at 751.8. You want to go ahead and make a table of the Q's and the W's for your major components. We're going to have the compressor. We're going to have the combustor. We're going to have the turbine. And don't forget this heat exchanger, which is often forgotten. Isn't it often forgotten? So you don't want to forget that uh, that heat exchanger down there. And so some of these have zero for heat transfer. The compressor, zero. How about the turbine, zero. How about the work transfer, the combustor, zero. And the heat exchanger, zero. Now let's fill in the non-zero <coughs> values. So for the compressor, it's negative 425.8. 2 kilojoules per kilogram. How did we calculate that? C sub P times the delta T, right? So just the first law around the compressor. So the work of the compressor is C sub P. And because of the negative sign, then you'll have a T1 minus T2 actual. Okay, 
And then for the heat, ex uh, the combustor, it's 1037.2. How did we calculate that? Just going from X to 3. So Q of the combustor, C sub P, T3 minus Tx. All right. How about for the turbine? We get 998.2 out. And for the heat exchanger, down here, negative 464.1. Have you solved the problem before where you've said, okay, I think I've gotten these all. Let's sum up the column of Qs, and you get 573.1. Sum up the column of Ws, and you don't get the same as the sum of the Qs. Have you done one like that yet? Well, if you haven't, you've done really well. But if you're like the average student, you have an error somewhere. And then you have to go check it. True. Uh, but this should be 573.1 kilojoules per kilogram. So how do I calculate for part A the net power developed in megawatts? I have to scoot down a little bit. Um, I have to calculate um, W dot net, which is the mass flow rate times the lowercase w net, which I just calculated lowercase w net, the specific work of the cycle. But how do I get the mass flow rate? Well, the mass flow rate is going to be the volumetric flow rate at state 1 divided by the specific volume at state 1. And how do I get the specific volume at state 1? Well, we know that pressure 1, specific volume at 1 is equal to RT1. So the specific volume at 1 is RT1 divided by P1, true? So a little bit of work to get the mass flow rate. And uh, when we calculate that, we get cap W dot net comes in at 51.6 megawatts. How about for part B, which was how much, what is the rate of heat transfer in the combustor? So Q dot in the combustor, the mass flow rate times, the specific combustor and Q dot in the combustor comes in at 93.5 megawatts. And then the last was the thermal efficiency of the cycle. Wouldn't that be net power out divided by heat transfer in in the combustor? Sure. <coughs> and that comes in 55.3%. Excuse me. Hmm. Yes, sir. Um, how is the temperature at Y less than the temperature of X if the heat got transferred from Y to X? The, uh, did I write that down wrong? 575 temperature X. Well, uh, okay, let's do this. Let's take a look at the temperatures are written down correctly. Um, if I plotted the temperature as a function of position through the regenerative heat exchanger. All right, and for this problem, T4 was our highest temperature, which was up here at 907, 906.7, a little over 900 Kelvin. And T2 um, actual is 713. So 713 is temperature 2 actual. This is temperature 4 actual. Okay, so as it goes through this heat exchanger, the temperature of the cold, maybe I should draw it as blue, colder fluid, is going up, and the temperature of the hotter fluid is going down. You can still have it where the hot fluid exits hotter than the cold, or if it was a really good heat exchanger, how could it possibly look? It could be like this and like this. So that's one of the reasons why we have, or that the best reason for a counterflow heat exchanger. And so in that case, what did we get out for TX? We got it at 868. TX 
and the T um, Y was 752-ish. So it is lower. Yeah. Uh, you can't do it if they are what they call parallel flow. If the hot comes in and the cold comes in on both sides like that, Yep, yep. So it's good to, in the illustration, show them as going in different directions, which is true. All right, any other comment, question? All right. Okay. Um, once I know what comes out, of the hot fluid and goes into the cold fluid to make T2 calculated, I calculate T2, then I know what came out of the hot. So I just go back and do an energy balance only on the hot fluid. Um, so the, uh, um, let's see, the regenerator effectiveness equation, right, was written as a, in terms of constant specific heats, T4 minus T2, that would be the maximum temperature change. We chose to write it in terms of Tx, which comes out greater than T2. It's kind of what went into the cold fluid in the numerator that's into the cold. You could also rewrite this, the same equation. You could say it's T4 minus Ty. What's that? It's the perspective of uh, out of the hot, and you still have T4 minus T2. We prefer to write it this way because we're often interested in getting Tx more so than Ty, but if you wanted to get Ty, there's another way of doing it. It's the same effectiveness, right? Isn't this the same effectiveness? All right. Well, you just keep enhancing the cycle. So here, we already saw it in one of the little video clips I showed, is you have really two places where fuel comes in and is burned. And that's really pragmatic because you have to have a very, a lot of engineering goes into those blades in the turbine section so that they can withstand the high temperatures. Thermodynamically, let the temperatures go to the, you know, sky's the limit. Let them be high, high, high. Metallurgically, no. Uh, there's real practical constraints. So what they'll do is they'll put it through, make it hot, put it through one set of turbines. It's now cooler. Add some more fuel, burn, and probably use up all the oxygen at that point, and then pass it through another turbine. So it's, it's practical consideration of staying below a maximum temperature. So here we're showing how you have on a temperature entropy diagram, how you're having that heating in the regenerator, the cooling of the exhaust gas regenerator, burning of the fuel up to the maximum, expansion, more fuel burning to the maximum, then expansion, etc. So the goal, just like in the Rankine cycle, is bring in a lot of heat at high temperature. Okay. Bring in a lot of heat to high temperature. Well, once you have the reheat and the regenerative Brayton, you can add intercooling. Doesn't it get complex fast? <laughs> so intercooling. Uh, only one person in the earlier class had heard of intercoolers for automotive applications in engines. How many people have heard of an intercooler? There's a few more here. So is it with the supercharger? It, it, it could be both. Either the, the, Tur or the, turbo. the super or the turbo, right? Is that where most of you have heard it? And so the ideas, the same type of idea, although a slightly different motivation. For the automobile engine, you have a positive displacement engine. You have only five liters of the sucking or blowing, whatever perspective you want. But you need to get in five liters of oxygen in that engine. You'd like as much oxygen, so bring it in at high pressure, turbocharger, supercharge, and low temperature. 
that packs in the most oxygen per unit volume. So right after the supercharger, they put it through an intercooler to cool it to keep it dense, then ingest it into the engine. Likewise, right after the turbocharger, put it through an intercooler, then ingest. So that's the purpose is get more oxygen in that cylinder so you can burn more gas and make more power. Okay. How about here, though? Well, what we find is that if you have a compressor, that consumes a lot of energy to compress gases like an air, an ideal gas. You can do it a little more efficiently if you break up the compression into two stages and in between the two stages, cool it. Cool it. How is that going to improve? How is it going to reduce the amount of work? Well, it's a little complex to understand. Let me try and give you the equation. It's out of chapter 6, though. The equation is anybody remember that equation it's at the last section in this textbook of chapter 6 it's for an open system analysis and what we have is for this open system we're flowing through and if you're interested in either the max work out or the minimum work in it will happen if it's isentropically, uh, no irreversibility, so it's um, going to be internally reversible flow through that device. And it works both for getting the most work out or putting the least work in, depending if you're trying, like a turbine or a compressor. But it's, it's the integral VDP. And I think I've mentioned this equation already this semester. But why, when students look at this equation, they're saying, okay, I understand work. The work is the integral of VDP, but they think there's a typo. First time they see it, what do they think the typo is? It needs to be, Professor, the integral PDV. That's what it needs to be. And for a closed system, they're absolutely correct. But for an open system, it's not a trivial equation to re-derive. I mean, it's derived in the textbook. I drive it when I'm in Thermo 1, and I probably could or want, maybe I want to redrive it right now, but I'm not going to. But the structure is it's the integral V dP, which is just backwards because people are thinking, I'm going to put a PV diagram. I'm going to put from state 1, and I'm going to go up here to state 2, and I'm going to go along some reversible, internally reversible process. And it would be, you would think it's the area under the curve. But that's not right. What is the area that we visually would be able to say that's our work? It's to the, yeah, it's to the left. It's toward the left end. Because what's the, what's the uh, independent variable in the integration? The pressure. It's the pressure. Right, So that's the visual image of how much work if you have internally reversible flow to an open system. And so what we want to do is we want to minimize that work. So you think of it, we're doing it with an ideal gas. And isentropic process for an ideal gas is PV to the K is constant. Does that look good? Do you recall that equation? PV to the K is a constant isentropic compression or expansion of an ideal gas. And we also remember for an ideal gas, PV is equal to RT. So as we compress it, which is being shown right here, going this way from state 1 to state 2, that's a compression. The temperature is not staying the same. There's no heat transfer with the surroundings, but just by nature of compressing a gas, the temperature goes up. So right here is a line of constant temperature. Right here is a line of constant temperature. And that's maybe temperature high and that's temperature low. So as we're compressing, the temperature is going up. What you'd like to do is someplace along the compression process is stop the compression. Before you get to the pressure you want to get to, stop at an intermediate pressure. Well, here's your low pressure, here's your high pressure. Let's just stop right in the middle. Take it halfway for our pressure. Where are you going to stop? You're going to stop right about there. 
Now, if you're going to put it through an intercooler, what's going to happen? Is the intercooler going to change the pressure? No, the intercooler is only going to change the temperature. And it's going to drop the temperature back possibly as low as the original temperature you had. Think about air coming in. If it comes in at 300 Kelvin, it's going to be greater than 300 Kelvin at state C. They use letters here. But after the intercooler, if you could reject it back to air ambient temperature, maybe it got all the way back to 300 C. It would be ridiculous to get it below 300 C. You'd have ice cubes or something, you know, dry ice somewhere. That's not, that doesn't make any sense. So basically it goes back to, let's say, 300 Kelvin. So where is the next state after the exit of the intercooler? It's right there, isn't it? Constant pressure. So instead of going on a path that goes all the way up, we'll go halfway up in pressure, stop, cool it, and then finish the compression. So I know this is really hard to see here. Uh, maybe I didn't draw this very well to begin with. Is I want to compare two shaded areas. One is if I just compressed it the whole way from the beginning. That shaded area, maybe I'll color like this. The other shaded area, I'm going to stop, cool it, and complete the compression. And let's shade that, I don't know, green. Green color. And what is the visual difference? It's that missing area, that non-overlapped area up in that corner. That's your savings in work, visually. Instead of having one compressor, two compressors with the intercooler, it will actually cost less mechanical power for the same pressure increase. That's intercooling. We have all the tools to analyze it. All right. So, so uh, what's it look like on a temperature entropy diagram? Well, we're going to go from 1 to C isentropically straight up. But then we're going to stop at some intermediate pressure. That's a line of constant pressure. We'll cool it back down. Maybe D is all the way back to the temperature that it came in. Maybe it doesn't quite get to it. Maybe it only gets that far. But it would be best to cool it all the way down, if you can, and then put it through the compressor to get it back up, the second compressor, to get it back up to the highest pressure. And there you go. So now we're getting complicated because we have the, the letters, new states, X and Y. We have turbine stages. What is this? A and B. And then they have intercooler C and D. And they're really not in any order, are they? But I believe this is consistent with the textbook to help you. Okay? Uh, so what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, I'm going to just... Scroll over to where I think I really want you to pay attention. I know this is a sales brochure or thing on the Siemens. And they're talking about all kinds of things, but right in this area. Uh, let me scroll over some more. Sign this is a pretty good image of the emissions combustors. performance over a wide load range and is capable of single digit NOx and CO emission levels. The burners can be easily removed for maintenance. There's a lot of burners in there, isn't it? Looking more closely at the turbine section, the SGT800 features a highly efficient three-stage design. Gas turbine blades are operating in a tough environment. The SGT800's efficient cooling system and insulating thermal barrier coating ensure optimal performance and lifetime. You can see they're like ceramic. The blades at the last... But um, there's really a lot to be gleaned because I remember when I took this class, there wasn't the internet. <laughs> And they would show you a picture and a diagram in the book. And they only showed one picture in the book. And they thought, oh, I'm going to gain a whole bunch out of it. And you, you almost have to be around something to really see the three-dimensional, see it rotate. And so now 
that with the internet, these videos are, I think, very helpful at understanding what a gas turbine really looks like. Thank you for your attention. I'll pick up there next time.